Valerie Amos, you've had a fantastic career as a cabinet minister in the UK, the first person of Afro-Caribbean descent to occupy that role. You've been High Commissioner to Australia and of course you spent, what, six years in the UN system as leading the humanitarian uh, dimension of the UN's responsibilities. So let's begin with the, uh, the multilateral stuff. And in particular, you were uh, quite critical of the big beasts in the UN jungle for lack of transparency, accountability and their participation in decision making. Can you say a little bit more about the hopes you had when you went into that UN role and what you found and what you're disappointed by? Well, one of the things that I think really struck me when I was at the UN uh, looking after humanitarian affairs is that, um, of course, across the world, everybody understands that humanitarian affairs is about helping people who are most vulnerable, those people affected by conflict, by natural uh, disasters, and that you try as much as po uh, possible to take the politics out of that. Um, my experience at the United Nations was that it was all about politics. Um, if you look at something like Syria, uh, Yemen, uh, uh, Iraq, many of the conflicts we've seen across the world, South Sudan, elsewhere, that where you could not get the permanent members of the Security Council to agree on the action that needed to be taken politically, it had a damaging and very often negative impact on what we were able to do on the humanitarian side. So it took almost two years, two years, with Australia, um, New Zealand and Jordan playing a key role as members, elected members of the Security Council then, before we were able to get our first resolution on the humanitarian situation in Syria. You know, looking back on it, uh, it's an absolute scandal. This was about helping people most in need. So that's why I'm so critical of the role uh, that they can play, the negative role that they can play, because of the politics of a situation. But when they work together, it works extremely well. How much worse can the politics of the situation now get with the new US administration, which is frankly visibly walking away from any kind of even notional commitment to global public goods pursued through multilateral institutions? I mean... I think one of the things that everybody's learnt from uh, the time that President Trump arrived in the White House to now, and it's still early days, is that you have to read the Twitter feed, you have to read what's said, but the actions that are taken can also be different. Uh, so I think it's too soon to tell. Clearly there's a working out of what the role uh, is going to be uh, in terms of foreign affairs. It may be that there never is um, a great deal more clarity. It may just be that um, as uh, uh, one uh, person said today um, in a very interesting debate on global security, that it's a la carte uh, in terms of, of the role in terms of uh, foreign uh, policy. So the actions, the actual actions that the US uh, takes in different situations is I think the thing that's going to count. Of course, one of the things that matters most in terms of actions is financial support for the UN system, which is hugely dependent on US formal contributions and indeed voluntary contributions on top of that. How well are you going to be able to survive at all in that humanitarian space, in particular if the US really abdicates any sense of responsibility there? A lot really depends on Congress and the extent to which Congress fights the corner for the United Nations and particularly for response to humanitarian action, for the development side of uh, the UN's work. I've been very concerned about uh, what has been happening to uh, UNFPA, which is the UN's uh, population organisation, uh, for example, and uh, the proposed pullout uh, there. We've seen um, over the last few years, even before uh, the Trump administration, what happened to uh, UNESCO. So this is not new and the role that Congress plays in pegging back proposals that come from the White House will be critical. How much confidence can you have about the better angels of our nature prevailing in the US Congress with the Republican majorities being as they are? If you work in the United Nations one of the things that you learn very early on is that you have to find the people uh, in Congress who support uh, what you do, may be critical of aspects of it, but have a degree of influence on the Hill that they're going to uh, be able to use. 
on both sides of the House, Republican and uh, Democrat. And I'm absolutely sure that my former colleagues at the UN are doing that as we speak. Of course, one of the reasons the US is in the position that it now is with its leadership is a result of the kind of populist forces that have also been at work in Europe and particularly, of course, in Britain with the Brexit referendum last year. What is your take on the implications of this for Britain's future? As a former cabinet minister, you must be with a strong multilateral and strong internationalist disposition, you must be in a condition of almost despair about where the UK is at at the moment, are you? I worry deeply about uh, the referendum uh, decision and the fact that we're going to pull out of the European Union. I think the long-term uh, consequences for Britain, for Britain's future, uh, both politically, economically and socially, um, I don't think are good for, uh, for Britain. But the thing that I worry about the most is that I think that that referendum vote was not so much about Europe, but was much more about people feeling excluded from our uh, political process, about people feeling that the concerns that they had were not being listened to, uh, that people talked about the benefits of globalization when they weren't seeing them uh, on the ground, and that the people who actually they felt were, as it were, listening to them, had a degree of empathy at the local situation that they found themselves in, uh, poor housing, uh, uh, real challenges in terms of uh, the health sector and what was happening to their hospitals, uh, to their local uh, clinics, what was happening to housing, that the people who were listening to those concerns uh, were people from uh, the right, from parties like UKIP for example. And I think it's a real indictment uh, of our mainstream political parties, including uh, my own, the Labour Party, that people are feeling like this. Have the left recaptured some of that constituency now on the evidence of the recent election with Jeremy Corbyn's uh, move back from the dead to position the Labour Party in a much stronger outcome than uh, most people had expected? Or was that just a form of sort of left-wing populism rather than signalling a return to the kind of politics with which you and I are I think there are a couple of things in there that are um, important. Uh, one is that there was a lot which was anti the austerity measures in what Jeremy Corbyn um, has been consistently saying um, and what was in the Labour Party manifesto and I think that really spoke uh, to people and what they wanted uh, to see. But I also think that the recent um, uh, election was uh, what's being called the revenge of uh, the Remainers. And there is a very clear correlation between uh, the areas where you saw a huge boost in the Labour majority and people who in the referendum voted to stay in the European Union. What that means for us in the longer term, I think will be tested as we move forward. Do you see any prospect at all of a second referendum and a retreat from the Brexit decision? At the moment, uh, I don't. I think that what we would have to persuade those people who voted to leave is that this is not in their long-term interests or in the long-term interests of Britain. I fear that we are very far from that right now. Valerie, it's been terrific having you back in Australia, back in Canberra and back at the ANU. What's been your take on this Crawford Leadership Conference? We've tried to use as a vehicle for getting more informed debate, perhaps developing a degree of consensus among those who influence policy makers on the move forward. What's, what's been your experience at this forum? Well, it's been great um, to be here and have the opportunity to uh, talk to uh, friends um, who I was with when I was here in Australia before, but also to meet uh, new people, and um, also to be uh, in a place where you're bringing together policy makers, uh, politicians, and people from the business uh, community. What I was really struck by, however, is that although we're talking global, the focus very much was on the big powers, was on China, uh, was on the United States, um, to a certain extent uh, the European Union, um, and what was happening here in this region. Hardly a mention of the African continent, uh, of South America, of the Middle East. Uh, and I think that uh, if the forum is really going to look at the global challenges, uh, we talked security this morning, 
then it needs to tap in uh, to those areas a bit more as well. But a great opportunity uh, to talk about uh, current challenges. Well, absolutely fair comment and we'll take that into account for next year's agenda and I hope that one of these days before too long we'll have you back to participate as brilliantly and constructively and as helpfully as you did at this conference. Thanks so much. Thank Amos. you and always good to see you Gareth.